Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lucinda Vakura, the Business Development and Marketing Director with the Alford Group. Uh, today's session is titled Tomorrow's New Normal, Four Elements of an Action Forward Approach to Planning. Alexis Cook and Jamie Philippi will be today's moderators. But before I turn things over to the two of them, I want to tell you a little bit about the Alford Group and walk you through a few webinar logistics. So I realize that many of you are very familiar with the Alford Group, um, but for those of you who may not be, uh, we are a national full service consulting firm specializing in the nonprofit and social sectors. Uh, we offer services in fundraising, strategic planning, data analytics, crisis management, communications, and much more. Really, our goal is to provide the resources, the tools, the structure to empower organizations to have the biggest impact possible. Um, we are a proud member and sponsor of ASP, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, uh, both at the local um, level uh, in many regions across the whole country, but also at the national and international levels as well. We are a proud minority and woman owned and led firm, uh, including being a certified women's business enterprise. And finally, we're a member of the Giving Institute. If you'd like more information about the Alford Group, you can surely check out our website, which is in the bottom right-hand corner here, alford.com. Um, before we jump in, I do have a, a few uh, webinar logistics that I want to uh, walk us all through. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded. And uh, following today's event, you'll receive an email from the Alford Group with a direct link to the full recording uh, as well as the slides from today's presentation. Uh, as soon as we finish the event today, you will be immediately prompted to complete a very short survey. Uh, we encourage you to take the survey it truly as short as four or five questions, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Everyone joining us today is in listen-only mode for the duration of the webinar. Uh, if you have a question at any time throughout uh, the hour that we have together, um, please chat it to us. So if you mouse over the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A icon. If you click on that, it'll open a window and there you can chat your questions to the panelists. And we will answer as many questions as we can at the end of today's presentation. Finally, we invite you to join us on Twitter. We will be live tweeting uh, throughout the event using the hashtag NPO strength and our Twitter handle, which is at the Alford Group. So we invite you to join the conversation with us on Twitter as well. With that, I'm going to hand things over to our moderators today, uh, who are Alexis Cook, Senior Consultant with the Alford Group, and Jamie Philippi, Vice President with the Alford Group. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you, Lucinda. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar on an important and timely topic. Um, I am Alexis Cook. I am a senior consultant for the Alford Group. I've been with the firm for over a year and a half, and I've had um, I've spent 15 years in Chicago leading and working for nonprofit development teams. Um, since joining the Alford Group, I have been privileged, truly privileged, to work with and support many organizations across the sector, build their strategic plans, and or think through emergency and crisis response plans. I'm really excited to be here today with Jamie. So I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Great, thanks Alexis. I'm Jamie Philippi, Vice President at the Alpha Group. And I've been with the firm for about four years after a long career in fundraising and nonprofit management, uh, primarily in Chicago. Most recently, I was with the Chicago Community Trust and prior to that, the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. I too have been privileged to work with a lot of organizations on strategic planning and emergency planning, not just COVID, but in some instances, disasters, hurricanes and other natural disasters. So all of this is pertinent to what we're going to discuss today. And we are very happy that you have all joined us. So Alexis, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Here is a quick look at our agenda. Jamie will begin with a brief review of where we are today and an overview of some key definitions. 
And then I will share four brief but critical elements that the Alfred Group believes will strengthen any plan. We are most looking forward to today's dynamic panel discussion and our panelists who, thank you for joining us, will share their experiences um, creating and implementing different types of plans at different times. As a reminder, please use the Q&A function at any time to ask a question. I'll be monitoring uh, questions as they come in during the panel discussion, and it is our intention that, that at the end of the panel, we will have time to address as many of those as possible. Please don't forget to join us on Twitter, our hashtag NPO strengths. Great. Amy. Mm -hmm. So this year has been a year like no other in our history, and it's been full of challenges. Nothing feels good, no matter how hard we're working. The setbacks and realities facing billions of people worldwide are overwhelming. In, pl in planning, however, we strive to look forward and we strive to look at challenges as actual opportunities. And by identifying and understanding the impact of this year on our organizations, our colleagues, our mission, we can begin to map out short and long-term plans to move forward. Most of you, like our panelists and their organizations, likely implemented crisis response plans quickly after the onset of COVID-19. And these response plans may have transitioned into scenario plans to navigate the ongoing crisis of this year. We have all pivoted, swiveled, paused, regrouped, managed 360s, evolved, identified inflection and fulcrum points, and then repeated all of the above to match continued emerging needs as the devastating realities of the pandemic and our country's social and racial injustices specifically continue to take their toll. So to begin, let us quickly align on some important definitions. Crisis planning or crisis management describes the processes that an organization can use to respond to a critical situation that could adversely affect its profitability, reputation, or ability to operate. These plans may take the shape of a 30, 60, 90 day action plan or some other format designed to help the organization go day to day or week to week. This important planning exercise helps organizations triage or manage their current state while still enabling forward thinking. Scenario planning helps organizations navigate uncertainty while providing structure around making key strategic decisions. This is typically carried out by first identifying specific uncertainties and resulting different realities that might happen in the future, depending upon the outcomes of the identified uncertainties. This form of planning allows for long-term and short-term goals to be set while providing room for built-in flexibility and adaptability based on the projected outcomes. In other words, it's rather a if this, then that kind of scenario. Strategic planning, as we all know, is the process of documenting and establishing a direction for your organization by assessing your current and future state. The strategic planning process may affirm or refine an organization's mission, vision, and values as well as set long-term aspirational goals with short and long-term implementation plans that you'll use to reach them. When strategic planning, the Alpha Group encourages clients to look forward and consider specific initiatives, measurable outcomes, evaluation measures, staffing, budget, and other resources needed, including the parties to be responsible who will drive the plan to completion. So these three forms are all considered planning. Some are shorter, some are longer, but that is what we're going to look at today and the four elements to make all of those successful. 
and I'll turn it back over to Alexis. Thanks, Jamie. So there are a lot of meaningful resources out there on the many forms that our plans can take, um, not just this year, but especially this year. And here, rather than focus on the type of plans available and what would work best for your organization, we wanted to elevate four specific elements that, if embedded into your planning process, ultimately will strengthen your implementation plans and position you and your organization for success. This element, B analytical, could have been titled B logical. And I share this to acknowledge that there is so much at stake right now. And to plan with strength, we need to move forward logically. We do need to embrace our feelings and we do need our plans to validate our feelings in many ways. But with so much that we cannot control right now, one straightforward way to, to begin is to consider and define what we have now and assess how we got there. We can focus on the past and present. We should, and then use that to look forward. When you think about this uh, analytical phase, be honest in your assessment about your mission-centered work and its relevancy. This is the time to figure out how to appropriately measure your impact, especially if you do not already have the tools in place to do so effectively. Map the impact against what you know to be the evolving and probably increasing needs of the communities and or constituents you serve. Look at operations. Your staff, your partners, gather data points that are quantifiable and qualitative. Perhaps conduct brief surveys, hold meetings that allow room for open conversation. Consider known barriers or the challenges your organization has always faced or maybe facing for the first time and really truly look at that with an honest, transparent lens. Then assess what is working versus what is room for improvement and or refinement based on the known what's of your now and your true measured impact versus what is needed to maximize the future impact to fulfill your organization's vision. In your planning, use this data to inform and drive business decisions, aspirational goals and fundraising strategies. We, we encourage you to do this in order to amplify what will be maintained and grown and also validate what needs to, to go, let go of what needs to be relinquished. Very importantly, use your data to help set and or project measurable outcomes that are realistic and appropriate, motivated by these findings. We do want to be aspirational in our goal setting right now, but this may be the time to be realistic first and aspirational second. Um, and having a really solid look and assessment on your organization will help you validate, validate the right level of goal. It, uh, it really also may give you what you need to inform a refreshed mission statement, new, mis new vision and direction, or realigned core values. One way to center our work in reality is to create a time-focused framework. Uh, this will enable you to keep and maintain pace with milestones that are adaptive and relative while moving your organization forward towards aspirational and achievable long-term vision and goals. In a planning process, your assessment phase, the analytical, the analytical element may be very quick and less refined, like during emergency response planning where time is the critical factor and you need to get your mission fulfillment work out the door, you need to have a speedy response. It may be rooted in multiple outcomes based on projected but yet to be experienced circumstances as it would be in a scenario planning exercise, or it may be time may be a substantial component of your strategic plans first year to inform later action plans and strategies to reach your goal. So, when we think about managing a crisis or emergency plan, as Jamie described, a, a timeline may be in a 30 or 60, 90 day format. Um, you're gonna be quickly transitioning up and through your plan by design in order to navigate the now, and that's going to give you the markers you need within your framework by day by day, week by week measures. If your scenario planning, your timeline may be more fluid and adaptive to the actual outcomes and may span up to over may span up to or over a year in length, depending on the circumstances. 
And in strategic planning, your organization will be seeking a pathway towards achieving a long-term big picture goal through short and long-term implementation steps, which again can be measured by time. The Alfred Group has been encouraging our partners to create three-year strategic plans with inbuilt reassessment points. Um, this is as opposed to a five-year or longer planning uh, process. And that's an acknowledgement that perhaps more so now than ever, <laughs> these, um, these plans, we need to have inbuilt room so that our organizations can evolve year over year and success and growth can unfortunately be hindered when an organization becomes beholden to an irrelevant strategic plan in year four or five of operationalizing the strategies. Um, I'm really into acronyms. And so you, and maybe you are too, I don't know, but um, you've probably heard of SMART goals. SMART being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. We are two elements in, and our whole acronym of SMART goals have been covered, but um, I'm hoping you may have also heard of, uh, of the evolved version, which is SMARTY. And the Alford Group and my colleagues and I are grateful for this evolved version because our goals now need to be inclusive and equitable. So as a society and a sector and as individuals, we can no longer afford to operate without equity and inclusion guiding our work. So here is uh, here we really want to encourage you to be authentic in relation to your incorporation of diversity, equity, and inclusion principles and efforts into all plans moving forward. What do we mean by being authentic? I, I recognize, as I am sure you all would too, that our work for social and racial justice is a long road. It's a journey. It's not likely that a single plan with well-executed intentions is going to redefine an organization, uh, for example, as an anti-racist organization. But by doing the best we can, by leading authentically, setting strong goals and vision for ourselves, our colleagues, our organization, our constituents, and consistently taking action, as in building on plan over plan over plan, we will achieve uh, our organization's vision in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we really can all do quite a lot. I, I wanted to point out that some synonyms for authentic are genuine, dependable, true, and reliable. And it is just really important that we, we keep in mind the, the deep, the deep chasm that exists in our country and our responsibility to consistently work towards holding ourselves accountable to this important authentic place that we can in our planning, move ourselves and each other forward. Inclusion is a key element in planning specifically, and we'd like to remind you of the many benefits of engaging stakeholders and constituents in your organization's efforts to navigate a crisis, plan for multiple outcomes, or set long-term aspirational goals. So leadership and board members, donors, community members, constituent partners, founders, funders, stakeholders, long-term supporters, social media followers, we are so fortunate to work for organizations that have so many types of engaged individuals and so many ways of engaging them. There is a lot of value add when we work inclusively. Planning provides an opportunity. And especially if your organization may not be one that seeks feedback you know, a lot or perhaps represents a top-down decision-making model. So this opportunity to gather qualitative and quantitative data to inform your trajectory, your projections, and your vision um, when we operate inclusively. I did not mean for this to be our final element today. Rather, I see this as a loop. So when we are inclusive in our assessment phase and we are able to elevate staff voices at all levels so that the planning process is not in a leadership vacuum, we will in turn create stakeholders of our staff, we can inspire and maintain buy-in for the long-term vision and the short-term goals, and we'll validate the organization's starting place while also, if we're effective, boost morale internally. Um, the, same, the same lens can, can be applied up and out of our organization. The more voices you can authentically and appropriately engage in your planning process, the better informed the plan will be, 
the more successful the plan will be. Um, the Alpha Group uh, encourages our clients to look at this from a number of perspectives. You might conduct interviews. You might draw upon um, your board, your donor base, your community members. You might hold roundtables to gather feedback. Um, we can do this at the beginning of, of an organization's planning process. We can and, and do so in order to inform the vision and define the vision. We might conduct a SOAR analysis or a SWOT analysis. The Alfred Group and my colleagues, we've been um, big fans this year of the SOAR analysis, looking at strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results, uh, which by in turn creates some positive momentum uh, as part of the process of conducting that type of analysis. You might also consider uh, surveys, which we can do you know, early in the process, again, to help uh, to help articulate and prioritize the uh, goals and objectives of the planning process, you might conduct a broader constituent-led survey towards the end in order to um, affirm the direction that's emerged. So with these four elements in mind, um, we really encourage you to think and continue and continue to build upon your thinking, evolve your thinking along with your organization um, and not just plan to plan, but plan with strength. So I am really, this is the best and most exciting part of the day's discussion for sure. I will turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you, Alexis. And I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, Felicia Davis. Felicia is the president and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women an organization that envisions a world in which all women and girls have the opportunity to thrive in safe, just, and healthy communities. Felicia leads their strategic direction. And last year, they worked with nearly 3,000 donors and local partners. They funded 160 projects that served over 70,000 women, girls, transgender, and non-binary people across the Chicago region. Felicia is also active on many boards and volunteers and leads by example herself. So thank you for joining us today, Felicia. Darren Goss is the CEO of the Coastal Community Foundation since 2016. Uh, and he uh, helps lead the mission to create vibrant communities by uniting people and investing resources for the nine counties served along South Carolina's coast. Coastal Community Foundation is located in Charleston. Along with their board, he sets the strategic vision for the organization, working to empower individuals, families, and organizations to make a lasting impact through permanent endowed funds for charitable giving. The community Foundation has invested millions of dollars last year, 22 million through grant making, impact investing and scholarships. Darren, thank you so much for being with us today. Rachel Krinsky is the executive director of LifeWire, an organization that seeks to end domestic violence by changing individual, institutional and societal beliefs, attitudes and behaviors. LifeWire serves East and North King County in the state of Washington, offering survivor-driven trauma-informed services. They promote prevention through community-based training and coaching, and they lead through pioneering strategies and partnerships. LifeWire considers domestic abuse a human rights issue, and under Rachel's leadership, envisions a world in which every person lives in a safe environment free from oppression and with the opportunity to thrive. Rachel is an executive dedicated to social justice. And Rachel, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. Michelle Stoff. Michelle serves as the executive director of the Million Dollar Roundtable Foundation, a global 501c3 grant making organization that operates as a charitable arm of an international association of life insurance executives and financial services professionals called the Million Dollar Roundtable. MDRT Foundation's mission is to give to charitable organizations worldwide 
demonstrating the generosity, service, and impact of its members. The members represent over 72,000 individuals from 70 nations and territories throughout the world. The foundation emphasizes both global and local community impact. And last year, MDRT members made possible 264 awarded grants, totaling 1.6 million across 33 countries. Since its founding 60 years ago, MDRT Foundation has awarded $36 million to 5,700 organizations. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today as well. Thank you. And now some questions for our panelists. Kickoff question for each of you. Um, please tell us where your organization is in your approach to planning. Are any of you in the middle of a plan, in the middle of planning, or embark about to embark upon a planning process? Um, and here we can talk about strategic or crisis or scenario planning. So Rachel, may I call on you first? Sure. Um, so LifeWire is in the last year of a three-year strategic plan. We are in the middle of a capital campaign and we are in the process of forming our next three-year strategic plan. Um, so yes, it was an interesting time for COVID to land upon us. <laughs> yes, yes. Darren, where's the Coastal Community Foundation? Thank you, Jamie and, and uh, Michelle, Rachel and Felicia. It's great to be on the panel with you guys this afternoon. Uh, yeah, we're in the middle, uh, really uh, year two of a three to five year strategic plan is what we call it. Um, and uh, like Rachel, uh, there's no convenient time for a, a, a pandemic, but I think the fundamentals, a, a lot of what Alexis covered um, in her introduction is what has really helped us to be able to navigate the, uh, the, the last seven or eight months or so. So we're, we're right in the middle of a, uh, a strategic uh, framework or strategic planning implementation. Okay, great. Felicia? Thank you, Jamie. Um, so CFW is, we're in year four of a five-year strategic plan. And I must add, so I am um, the new president and CEO at Chicago Foundation for Women. I've been here or with COVID, it feels longer than it is, has been, but it's been about 19 months. And so I came in middle of um, a strategic plan as well as a quiet phase of a capital uh, comprehensive campaign. So obviously, um, you know, one year to go in the strategic plan, COVID has happened. And um, there's a lot to consider as we think about what the approach um, um, for our comprehensive campaign is moving forward. So there are a lot of moving pieces um, to be considered presently. Right. And Michelle? Hi, everyone. We had actually just launched our strategic planning process the first week of March. And then everything changed, obviously, um, a few weeks later. We had actually um, was questioning whether we should continue with the strategic planning process at that time. Everything so felt so strange and surreal. Um, and we were advised uh, that we should continue on and move forward with the planning process. And um, it, it couldn't have been better timing, actually. I think that with um, what better way to look at a strategic planning process or to look forward when, when everything is changing around you and, you and you need to be adaptive and you need to be responsive and, um, and, and flexible. So the strategic planning process at this time, at that time was actually a really good timing for us. And, um, and logistically, it was actually easier to schedule with my board and constituents because people weren't traveling. They were locked down. We were all locked down <laughs> virtually doing a process together. Right, right. So how did COVID impact these plans and what did, did you do or are you doing to respond and adapt? Rachel? So, you know, 2020 and the pandemic and all of these other things have been difficult, I think, for everyone. Um, it's been a particularly difficult year for survivors of domestic violence because the stay home orders have really increased the severity and the frequency of domestic violence. And so our mission has been perhaps more important than ever, and our need to be responsive 
um, to emergency needs, both in terms of safety needs, but also in terms of basic needs, because they relate so closely to safety needs for survivors has just been paramount. And so um, we have annual work plans that come in behind the three-year strategic plan goals, and we really just had to reprioritize some of the work. So we've continued to pay attention to what's in that annual work plan, but have put a lot more priority um, of all kinds of resources and energy into those emergency responses and the day-to-day -day work of serving survivors, and also into care for our staff. Um, it's been a really tough year for staff um, who ordinarily experience a lot of secondary trauma and vicarious trauma and have been experiencing much more of that and doing so in isolation because they're largely working remotely. Um, I will say that we were able to secure pretty early on a PPP loan and that has been a huge piece of the planning, not only from an administrative point of view, but because we were able to say to our staff members very clearly that, our, that their jobs were secure and let them know that so that they could focus their energies on survivors, that's been a really important piece of our strategy and to be able to keep telling them that, that they were secure in their employment um, things that we've deprioritized. We were going to be rolling out a whole new professional development strategy that everyone's been excited about and asking for, and the appetite and energy around professional development is just not there. Like, nobody's got any time for that this year. We haven't gotten rid of it. It's still part of our plan, but we're scooting it forward until the pandemic is over. Um, Another good example is that we have a multiple year giving society and it's a great part of our financial strategy. Um, this year with all the fluctuations in the stock market and people's attention span and remote stuff, we just haven't been asking donors to commit to multiple year giving for our annual campaigns. So it, it's been that kind of fine tuning. Um, it hasn't, we haven't changed any of the big picture goals in our strategic planning but we have changed where our focus is and we've changed some of the timing of the annual strategies. Um, the other thing I'll add is that after a brief period of sort of shock and reassessment in our capital campaign, um, similar to what Michelle said about her um, strategic planning process, you know, we, we took a breath, we reoriented, and then we have continued on with the campaign and we are continuing to move forward successfully in our capital campaign process. Um, it has also had to shift somewhat, but we've had a really committed group of volunteers and it is still moving forward. And I'm happy to say that we've been able to, you know, who would have known you could run a capital campaign through virtual um, coffee. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. yeah. Darren. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just echo a lot of what Rachel said. You know, we live here on the coast of South Carolina and we are used to natural disasters uh, just about every year. And I'm gonna knock on wood, we have some sort of hurricane event that, that really requires us as an organization to be light on our feet, uh, to be able to pivot. And so um, when COVID hit back in March, all we really did was we took a look at our continuity of oper uh, uh, operations plan um, recognize that we were going to have to do some things relatively um, quickly and, and stayed very flexible um, with the plan. So uh, we were able to pivot very quickly, um, not only in terms of taking care of the, the organizational um, uh, needs of the staff, as well as our, our donors and our board, but also being able to, to pivot very quickly with other funders in the region uh, donors who uh, we engage in, in the creation of a COVID relief and recovery fund. And because we, we actually um, have done crisis uh, disaster grant making every year for probably the last 30 years or so, um, getting those funds out through our sort of normal but abbreviated grant making process with our uh, grants community leadership team um, was, was pretty seamless. So um, I, I think that um, that experience in doing that was great. Um, in terms of our, our overall plans, we have uh, and we continue to evaluate um, the sequencing of certain things. You know, um, we wanted to get into a, a, a broader discussion about asset development for the organization um, last fiscal year. We're on a July 1 fiscal year. That didn't happen with COVID. 
So we pivoted that to this year uh, and we'll get into that heavily in the next couple of weeks. Um, so so we're, we're, we remain flexible in that way. Um, we have four strategic focus areas that, that deal with capacity, uh, conviction, which is our uh, DEI work, uh, credibility, which is uh, about our, our grant making, um, and, then, and then strategic communications, because we were and are making a big pivot as an organization. Um, and so none of those plans have gone out of the window. We've just uh, adjusted uh, and prioritized some things a, a little bit differently as a result of both uh, COVID-19 and some of the other things, Jamie, you mentioned and sort of contextualizing where we are today. Yeah. Okay. Felicia, how about you all? Yeah, um, I um, a lot of what's been said resonates with me. Um, it's important for me to like go like revisit where we were. Uh, so the week of March 13th, um, I was in DC for Foundations on the Hill. So we're lobbying on the Hill. Maybe some of my colleagues here have done that. So we're in DC. And uh, at the time, there was a lot of confusion still there. And we clearly have more certainty and clarity now than we did in those beginning days. But I will say to you, um, being there, um, may, I cut my trip short and I came back to the office and just closed the office ahead of whatever was going to happen with our local and also any national policy or directives that may have may be coming. Honestly, to give us time to think, I closed the office down and said, um, three of our senior, myself and two senior team members came into the office and said, all right, let's plan out business continuity. I mean, we're a community foundation. We're very much fundraising the good old fashioned way, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think last year I had um, over 700 of those meals, right? Breakfast, wow. lunch, and dinner, drinks, breakfast, lunch, and wash, rinse, repeat. So we're very much contact, personal contact heavy. Um, and so our processes were also very um, just not automated. I mean, there was never a need to automate those processes. But some of the things that we were benefited by, when I came on last year, I added in video conferencing um, for board meetings and such. So we had that um, hardware or software already as part of it. We didn't have to rush out with like the hundreds of other people trying to purchase something. Um, and every member of our team had laptops. So we had those two things going for us. We had a robust VPN, everybody had a laptop. Um, so we could set up remote work um, and we had already supported remote work, but not you know, not this much, not seven months at a time. Um, and so we quickly pivot. I think the first priorities like some of um, um, my colleagues have said today was really about staff. It was about what's our capacity? How do we get everyone up and running um, just to ensure our business continuity? How do we make people feel safe? Because the other thing is, this was a huge pivot from a technology standpoint. Let's be honest, not everyone in our organizations are as tech savvy as the next person. <laughs> Taryn's raising his hand. Um, and so you have, as a leader, I have to be really sensitive and provide a lot of space for people to come online and to get used to these new tools. And I think that was um, not only for CFW, but I think for a lot of organizations that, that like stability in your staff, um, I think I heard Rachel talk about the fact letting people know that their jobs were safe so that we could focus on others. So after we got that kind of um, um, set, the other thing was then to focus on what we could do for others. As a community foundation, one of the things we are fortunate enough because of the women who came before us, we do have some assets. So there was some security for ourselves, but in that moment, it, it I felt like we needed to meet that moment by being of service to others more than what we do as a community foundation. And so we pivoted to help other organizations apply for PPP. We worked with um, Financial Management Association uh, associates and others to help reach out to the community. We worked with banking partners um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you all know it now, there were a lot of issues with equity and access to um, banking institutions, and even in the community, when we look at the residents in the community here locally in Chicago, a lot of them are unbanked. So we leverage those banking relationships to have them actually cash those checks, those stimulus checks, so that people weren't paying those predatory type fees to, um, um, to actually get some, um, some relief. And then we had to shift gears on what it meant from a fundraising standpoint. So initially, um, you know, y'all, I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. There were weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks where there were no checks coming in and we stopped calling people. It was, it would have been, it would have been rude, right? We, the stock market had gone down at least 30% at that point. It was very bleak at the time and we didn't know what was to come ahead. So instead, um, leaning on the wisdom um, 
um, some wisdom that actually Alpha Group gave us about what happened in the last economic downturn. We just started doing well-being checks and calls and checking in with people and their families because we are all going through this together, right? So the, our donors and our long-term supporters were also going through this and may have been impacted. And we started just building those connections. And then after things were a little bit clearer, after the market started to recover a bit, after things started to open up, not taking away from you know, the sickness and things that were going on, we started to be able to engage in those conversations. And then the second pivot was around how we talk about that comprehensive campaign I, was, I said uh, mentioned earlier. And it seemed, again, tone deaf to come before people and just talk about us as the organization, especially about endowment dollars. So we pivoted that to this 3R strategy, which was response, recovery, and resilience, and really having a, a message frame about what, around what that means and, and, and taking our campaign in a different direction as it relates to how we raise those dollars and how we uh, leverage those dollars. And, and, and we've had a lot of success. I think someone else said this unprecedented success in virtual events and virtual fundraising. We had never made this much um, headway when it comes to our you know, annual uh, virtual um, um, platform. And this year, it's, it's, it's something that our, I think our skill set ha um, has increased tenfold and our ability to engage in a virtual space as well. So those are a couple of the observations and experiences at CFW. Great, thank you. Michelle? Um, a lot of what Felicia said about fundraising really resonates um, with me and with our experience. I'm going to stick with the strategic planning, though, because that was um, really such a COVID journey for us because of the timing of when we started the strategic planning. Um, and logistically, the, the pandemic affected just how we were going to do the plan. Um, we had really relied on um, multi days of in person um, planning processes with our leadership, our full board. Um, and as a, a global foundation, we have a lot of um, many countries represented on our board. So when we fly them in, we like to keep them in for a while for a couple of days so that we can, you know, really have some thought full planning time. All of that changed, obviously, with COVID. Um, we transitioned to doing everything virtually, and um, we were no strangers to Zoom. Um, however, uh, we were just using it at a much higher, higher capacity than we had intended. Um, but on the positive side, it allowed us to have our full board in many more of the planning sessions than we had originally intended. We were going to initially start with a core team for all, almost, you know, the majority of the planning sessions for the strategic plan. We ended up bringing the board in um, for more of them because we could. It was affordable. Um, it was all via Zoom. And, um, and that was actually timing wise, aside from having um, the inclusivity of having that representation in the process, um, it also helped them feel engaged during a time when we felt so distanced from each other. Uh, and then the structure of the plan itself changed. We initially were looking at a five-year plan. And, um, and as Alexis noted earlier, um, she counseled us to shorten the timeline. And we did a three-year plan. Um, clearly, it was so clear how quickly things could change. You know, mm -hmm. who knew us where we'd be in five years? But um, so the timeline changed. And also the structure of the plan. We ended up um, layering the, the plan such that it, it into two phases and um, the goals and the action items and the timelines were divided into two 18-month um, phases and phase one truly lays the ground the foundation for phase two so and it just it it made a lot of sense from a timing standpoint especially during um in time of covid there it was just a greater um, comfort level with the phase one foundation in terms of just looking at um, a shorter runway by looking at, you know, this foundational phase in 18 months, not even three years, 18 months, and then the second phase builds off of that. So that um, really made a, made a big difference to us. And I don't know that we would have gotten there um, without the changes that were necessitated by COVID. So how have your organizations responded to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all of the others in the Black Lives Matter protests and the racial justice movement? Um, has this impacted your work, your planning, your outreach, your mission, your team? 
and in what ways? Uh, Felicia, may I start with you this time? Sure, Jamie, thank you. Um, so on a lot of levels, this is a big moment um, and it was really important and it is really important to me that we um, meet this moment in the best possible way as an organization. Personally, I'm a black woman. Um, I live on the south side of Chicago. So if you know anything about um, economic or uh, the racial disparities in Chicago and how they are impacted, then you know that the south side of Chicago is an area that has been you know, touted for being disinvested in right now. Um, it's a desert. Um, the state of Illinois is a high mortality rate for Black women, um, higher than um, some of our third world countries. And so there are a lot of disparities in access and equity in Chicago. So personally, um, talking about race and racial issues is something that I came in when I um, applied for this position, you know, during, during the search process, I was very clear about this intersectional notion of, of gender equity and, you know, we're second wave feminism, you know, we're, we're an organization that has been fighting for and advancing gender equity for a very long time, but not as explicitly saying always that there can be no gender equity without racial equity. And so that has been our loud and clear clarion call. There cannot be um, gender equity without racial equity and calling out anti-Black racism. As an organization, we have been working through like what it meant for us to be formed in the second wave of feminism and some of our own internal things that have happened over the 35 years as an organization that haven't always been the best um, um, unintentional things. Um, but now that we have the benefit of understanding those in a deeper way. Um, as a board and a staff, we are on an anti-racism journey to, um, to um, be an anti-racist institution. So it's not enough um, just to say, you know, I am against those things. It's also to take an inward look at our policies and practices. Personally, I have been very, I'm very um, transparent, I guess. And so I did a number of videos in those early days um, in my home office, you know, um, when the unrest was happening, just personal, because it was happening to me unfolding in real time. I'm the mother of four black sons and a daughter. And what does that mean to know that their lives um, could be impacted in the very same way that George Floyd and so many others um, just, just because of the color of their skin. And so having those moments and having those conversations. Um, and so I think the biggest thing that is the, the clarion for us has been really making it very clear, explicitly clear to everyone that we as a foundation believe there cannot be gender equity if we also don't have racial equity. And so more and more embedding that thread and all of our work, looking at our past investments, we have, um, we just did a grant, our first response grant cycle, over like 50% of the organizations that we just funded in the cycle were not known to us. We were very intentional about going grassroots organizations, organizations led by people of color, women of color. We were very intentional about trying to put the resources directly in the communities where the most harm had um, um, ha has occurred because of COVID and the economic and health disparities and all of the things that we see in the news every single day. So I do think that this has been uh, uh, a really big moment for us. And then also I have to put a plug out in Chicago, I am one of over 20 women of color leading some of the biggest foundations in the city of Chicago. And as a group, we meet regularly and we have done collective um, calls to action um, um, op-ed in our local business um, newspaper here, which is Crane's Chicago Business calling out this and just being very clear about, you know, a lot of organizations have put out DEI statements, but what's the meat behind that and how are you measuring that and what that really means and pushing and pushing people to really understand that they should be doubling down on their investments in organizations that are community led or grassroots led by women of color, black women and people of color and really spending those dollars in that way. So I think this is a big moment for everyone in, 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 in philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you. Darren? Yeah, I'll just, Felicia, I hear you and I see you because um, obviously, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, at at, at Coastal Community Foundation, you know, before there was George Floyd and Breonna Taylor last summer, 
we had we had our Denzel Cornell, a, a young 19 year old boy who died in 2014, mysteriously um, committed suicide uh, in the full presence of a of a Charleston Police Department uh, officer. And then we had Walter Scott in 2015 in April. And then we had the Emmanuel Nine um, at the Mother Emanuel Church uh, summer 2015. And so, you know, a part of the journey that we have been on as a foundation was really sewn in uh, those tragedies that happen in our communities and, and our board and staff really asking themselves the question, you know, what kind of community foundation will we be for the communities we serve? And do we really serve the whole entirety of our, of our community, everyone included? And so uh, it was that framework and that background that really um, uh, has us where we are. Uh, our board and staff have committed to uh, racial equity institute training where all of us um, go through that training. We get a fundamental understanding of the, the political historical decisions that have created the, the disparities that COVID-19 has highlighted uh, and that, that, that they put pretty much shine a light on. Um, everything from policing to redlining to everything else. So we have a structural understanding of, of why we are where we are and the work that we do is contextualized through that framework. Um, and, and it also gives us common language. So we can, we can talk openly about the differences in perspectives on, on the, the, wor the, the world we live in. You know? And all, all of us get a chance to show up, as I say uh, periodically, comfortable in our own skin. Um, because we can say things and use words like they can describe me as Darren Goss, our black CEO, without feeling, uh, as my niece would say, some type of way. We can talk openly <laughs> about uh, white privilege or in internalized racial uh, inferiority and, and understand what those words and concepts mean without um, digging uh, into uh, issues that paralyze the conversation and stop us from being uh, the, the organization we need to be. I think, Jamie, um, what um, this summer did was really affirm the work that we have been doing. Uh, but to, like Felicia, and I'll end here, um, I had been personally reluctant to call out, you know, my my racial demography in the work that we do. I wrote a piece called "I Am Not All Right" right after the George Floyd um, incident, um, which was very, for me transparent and made myself very vulnerable, but at the same time, very freeing. And I, and I heard from people on our board and our community how impactful that piece was because it personalized and humanized um, an incident that happened uh, uh, across the country. And they could look at me and say, well, that, that legitimately could have been Darren. You know what I'm saying? So, so I think that context has been powerful for us and has given uh, energy and power to us as a thought leader, um, as a as a as a um, credible um, source of leadership in this particular space in our in our region, our state. So um, it just affirms the work that we've been doing. Michelle. Um, at the Parents Association, the association that um, the MDRT Foundation is related to. Um, in May launched a pretty comprehensive DEI initiative for its for our staff. Um, they're in the process of rolling it out now. And that was um, a really big step for the association. Um, it started a lot of conversations that were long overdue. Um, I will also say, just speaking to the, the I in, in DEI, um, I want to speak to the inclusivity. Um, global inclusivity just a bit further. I mentioned it earlier with our strategic planning process. Um, I think there was greater awareness um, for all of us going through the strategic planning process where we had a board that was um, roughly 50% from the United States and 50% um, outside the United States. And we just had a, we had a greater awareness of the importance of being inclusive of the voices beyond um, the United States where there tends to have been a greater strength and leadership of our foundation. And as we were going through our strategic planning process, we um, this was really front and center for us. And we made sure that through the strategic planning process, we had inclusivity in the constituent surveys. We, had, we did translated surveys. Um, we have a, a huge membership from the greater China region and Southeast Asia. And this was 
the first time or one of the first times that the MDRT Foundation has um, really has out has done comprehensive outreach in um, translated and culturally sensitive language. Um, and that was, um, you know, we haven't moved any mountains yet, but it was a big step for us. And uh, I felt worth noting. Rachel? So we have been working uh, strategically and significantly in racial equity since I've been at LifeWire. Um, I was hired in part because I've been working in racial equity for some years and LifeWire wanted to work towards that. Um, it's one of the nine goals in our strategic plan. And that does not mean that we've got it covered or that we, um, you know, we are, we are in it. And we um, have been working with some external consultants actually. And so the George Floyd murder happened in the middle of many other conversations that have been going on in our organization. And I would say highlighted some of the struggles that we're having. Um, and so just to name a few, um, one is that the domestic violence movement is in a very complicated situation where domestic violence and racial justice and the criminal justice system intersect in some very complex ways. Um, the DV movement worked very, very hard, for instance, to get mandatory arrest policies. And then they've had all kinds of really negative impacts that we didn't want and that have really hurt BIPOC folks and Black people in particular. And we are aware of that as a movement, or at least many of us are, and are working to try to unravel that. It's very complicated. Um, then as an organization, LifeWire has a history. You know, we are a, a white led organization. I am a white woman. We, have, we were started by white people in a very white suburb of Seattle. That is a changing demographic suburb. I am a white woman who is very committed to racial equity, but I'm still white and I'm the person who holds the most power in our organization. And that is complicated and nobody can make that not, com not complicated. Um, when the news came out that George Floyd had been murdered, even making decisions about how we were gonna respond to that got really complicated because if I make decisions, then it's top down and it's coming from someone who's white. But if I lean on the BIPOC people in my organization who are overburdened because of all the work we're doing with survivors and all the trauma they're experiencing, you can see the power dynamics and the issues of who makes decisions and how and who holds the burden. Those are racial equity issues and they're real and they're daily and we haven't figured out how to handle them. Um, so I would say these murders were very, very important and also part of all these other conversations that were happening. There was a lot of grief figuring out how it gives people space to, to talk about their own personal responses. Um, we've been doing caucusing, BIPOC caucusing and white people caucusing and even figuring out how to organize that. This is all very fraught. Um, People have a lot of feelings. We've tried to make space in the organization so that it's okay for people to speak out and to have feelings and to speak truth to power. And sometimes that gets messy. So I'm just, I'm just being out here that it's messy and sometimes there's real hurt and sometimes we have conflict and sometimes we don't know how to deal with that, especially because we are in recognition that um, most businesses and organizations center white culture and figuring out how to handle conflict in a way that preserves an organization and good relationships, but doesn't center white culture is also really complicated. I could do this for the rest of the day and I'm not going to, cause we don't have that much time. Um, but we are, we are all struggling together. The last thing I'll say is that we did make a decision with input from staff to sign on to a petition um, to defund the Seattle police with all the complexity that defund doesn't completely mean completely defund. Um, that was a risky thing to do. We've gotten some hurrahs, we've gotten some anger. Um, it has not gutted our funding, um, but I'm still hearing about it. Um, so it's been, it's been a moment, it's still a moment. Um, and we all know that these, unfortunately these, Injust situations, and we anticipate that these murders are going to continue to happen, and we're going to continue to have to figure out how to respond to them with all of this context. 
Um, so. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we are nearing the end of our time and I myself would like to keep talking because this is just fascinating. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time. Um, Lucinda, I see you're back on. May I turn it over to you? But first, thank you to our panelists. You all went through a lot in your organizations and uh, we appreciate your willingness to be transparent and share the successes and the maybe questionable outcomes in some cases, but thank you very, very much. Ditto, thank you so much. And this conversation is so rich and so important and so timely. There are questions we didn't get to and there were questions from the audience that we didn't get to, which I think really proves how important this conversation is. I'd like to offer that perhaps we can continue this conversation through a blog so we can work with all of you uh, as the panelists to answer anything that we um, didn't get a chance to. And we are happy to put that out in a blog post. And we, of course, welcome comments, ideas, thoughts from all of you as participants. I mean, we want to hear from you um, and keep this conversation going. So on the screen here is our email address, info at alford.com. Please do um, email us. Um, no one has all the answers, right? We're all figuring this out together in this new normal that we're in. So let's, let's keep that conversation going. To be respectful of everyone's time, I, I do need to wrap us up. Thank you again to the panel, um, bringing your expertise and leadership to this conversation. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Jamie, for moderating this great event. Just two quick reminders. You will um, receive an email from us with the slides from today's presentation, as well as the full recording um, of this webinar. And once we conclude here in just a second, you'll receive a prompt to complete a very short survey. So please consider filling that out. We'd love your feedback on how we did and to plan for future webinars. Um, again, contact us if we didn't get a chance to answer your question. On your screen is our, our email and our direct link to our COVID-19 resources toolkit. So please take advantage of that as well. With that, I want to uh, wrap us up. We will now disconnect. I hope everyone has a really great day and take care.